It's Ken Harbaugh on the Midas Touch Network. This week, I've got two of the world's foremost experts on far-right terrorism in America. Bruce Hoffman and Jacob Ware help us understand the dangerous combination of religious extremism, gun culture, and a desire to overthrow the government. Plus, how today's Republican Party is complicit. This is a good one. Thanks for watching. My guests today are Bruce Hoffman and Jacob Ware. They are fellows at the Council on Foreign Relations and co-authored God, Guns, and Sedition, in which they map the rise of far-right terrorism in the U.S. and offer ways to counter it. Bruce, Jacob, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having us. Uh, I love the title. I'm terrified by it, but it does capture the whole thesis. And I want to get into that, but I would like to start by asking what is different about the far right terrorist threat we face today because america has experienced domestic violent extremism before we have long been a country awash in guns and religious fervor and seditious movements but the current threat is something for which we seem woefully unprepared as a society i'm wondering what makes this moment especially dangerous if it's not new it is dangerous it isn't new. And in fact, the book traces a trajectory that we track to the 1980s uh, when movements that hitherto had been pretty much oriented towards hate and intolerance adopted or, or, or grafted onto itself, as you just pointed out, this very salient and prominent anti-government extremist position leading to sedition. So what's different uh, now compared to then? Two words, social media. Back in the 1980s and the 1990s, this was a real movement, but it was geographically dispersed and disparate. It was isolated individuals who maybe serendipitously or fortuitously had come together. Um, but making these connections and networking was enormously difficult. In the 21st century, and particularly in the past decade, the movement has been able to connect with like-minded people to inspire, to motivate, and ultimately even animate them to acts of violence through this contact connectivity and through this networking. And that's only possible because of the, the revolution in digital media and the advent of social media. Jacob, I'd like to put this question to you. I would submit that there is another significant difference between threats we faced in the past and the, the threat we face today from far-right extremism. And it's the political cover being offered by a major American political party. I think you have to go all the way back to maybe the, the second KKK and the political cover provided by the, the Democratic Party in the South, with, which ushered in decades of a, of a terrorist regime. And you have something similar developing today, I would argue, in which a far-right extremist movement, a violent movement, is increasingly being given political cover by the Republican Party. Is that fair or is that going too far? In August 2017, um, a rally occurred at a place called Charlottesville, Virginia, home of the University of Virginia, where a group of uh, explicit and outspoken white supremacists and neo-Nazis gathered for an explicitly white supremacist cause of maintaining you know, Confederate symbology um, and a terrorist attack occurred at that place and a young woman was killed. After that moment, we had this very painful, uh, drawn out back and forth in the media where President Trump basically refused to condemn the perpetrators. And he said those, those famous, I think six words, there were very fine people on both sides. Uh, in our book, we trace a number of attacks and extremists that, that trace their um, a big portion of their kind of um, emboldening to that moment, right? That feeling that we can gather on behalf of these ideologies, we can gather and cause acts of violence, and actually the White House will protect us. And I think that helped inspire further organizing, further activism, leading up to the, the, the famous uh, presidential debate where President Trump told the Proud Boys to stand back and stand by. And of course, they did stand by, wait for his orders, which emerged on January 6th, when he declared, let's walk to Pennsylvania Avenue. 
One correction to the narrative that I think is important is we have this mentality, we have this, this idea that far-right terrorism in the United States today is primarily a, an issue of right versus left, right? Republicans versus Democrats or uh, white people versus everybody else. So white people versus minorities, white per- people versus Jews, uh, conservatives versus liberals, however you want to frame it. And that's not entirely true. And that's one point that, that Bruce and I have been really keen to, to try to correct. The front cover of our book shows a gallows and a noose that was erected outside the US Capitol on January 6th. That was intended for a conservative, evangelical Republican vice president. We've seen numerous cases since then of Republicans who don't tow the uh, kind of MAGA orthodox uh, orthodoxy uh, being threatened. We've had individuals saying that you can uh, sign up for rhino hunting licenses. And there's no limit to how many rhinos you can hunt. Uh, Nikki Haley, who recently dropped out of the presidential race, had requested Secret Service protection because of the volume of threats against her. Um, so yes, I think top cover matters. And I think uh, certainly there are individuals on the political right right now who are not being outspoken enough against political violence. But at the same time, uh, they are actually threatening themselves by doing so because we've seen time and time again over the past kind of uh, seven, eight years that individuals who do not toe the line, who do not stay in line, um, they will find themselves liable to be targeted as well by the movement one day. But the targeting of those individuals, those traitors to the movement uh, from from within, that is merely the first step in in taking on the larger threat which they perceive as the left and the moral rot that the the decadent west Mm -hmm. is experiencing what you're getting at is enormously consequential and important is that this is this is a movement that brooks no dissent from any quarter we just have to think back to the morning of january 6 2021 when pipe bombs were found outside both the rnc and the dnc so this movement threatens democracy and freedom, both not even both externally and internally, but not necessarily even sequentially. Is there an ideological coherence, though? When I when I try to parse what Trumpism means, it's more a cult of personality than an ideological movement. And maybe we have to separate the two. I mean, the right wing extremism that you write about far predates the rise of Trumpism, but they they seem fully married right now. Jacob? Well, I think that's one of the elements that led to January 6th is we had a kind of a failure of imagination Um, because the people that gather there, the groups and ideologies that gather there are actually quite diverse, right? You have anti-government militias who are driven by gun rights and libertarian issues. You have QAnon supporters, right, who believe that the Democratic Party and other kind of prominent institutions are being led by satanic, uh, pedophile, <laughs> Satan-worshipping pedophiles who are going to be gathered up um, – you have kind of non-ideological people who just who, who feel overlooked. And what President Trump managed to do is he managed to get all those people together under a bigger tent and then drive them towards a certain location on behalf of a certain mm-hmm. grievance. Uh, so there was almost a failure of imagination to really understand how unifying uh, he has, has become, how powerful he is, how much he can drive momentum and drive energy, drive opportunity. Um, in a way that is very, I think, um, powerful, very uh, intoxicating to the people who are in that movement. If there is a cohesive force, then it, it seems to be grievance itself. It, it's not an, an aspirational movement. It's not seeking to build anything. Um, it's seeking to destroy and punish. And you look at Donald Trump's pledge from his campaign to be a retributive president in a second term. It really is grievance driven more than anything, which I guess makes for a big tent, but it doesn't really build anything. Is that, is that right, Bruce? 
Well, it's certainly grievance driven, but it's also, I think, about harnessing what is just a a collapse of trust in elected officials. I mean, President Trump and those who are running um, in tandem, in essence, or aligning themselves with him are talking about government that is broken, that has ceased to serve the people, and therefore they're advocating very extreme solutions. I mean, we have the first presidential campaign, I believe, in history. I'd be very surprised if this is not the case, where a presidential candidate admits that they're going to be dictator for a day, and that does not dissuade or deflect any support. So yes, it's grievance, but it, it goes even beyond that to just, uh, as, as all revolutionaries promise, a remaking of society, a remaking of governance, a completely new and different order. Do you have a clear picture of what the new order is, though? It, it seems like the only imperative is to destroy what exists and to exact retribution. But other than removing democratic safeguards and regulatory safeguards, it it's not clear to me that the new order proposed is very well thought out. Well, it's also purging the civil service service of anyone who has any kind of professionalism or independence. I mean, we're talking about a subservient state. That's the new order, but in essence, and you pointed out a minute ago, and I think you're absolutely right, is that this is more a cult of the personality than a co any kind of cohesive ideology. We're not talking about a unified or a monolithic movement, but we are talking about a person whose every word resonates with it and doesn't really brook any kind of uh, skepticism or doubt, which is also quite extraordinary. Jacob, can you talk about the international components of this movement and how, for the first time in, certainly in, in my memory, maybe ever, our allies across the world are looking at the U.S. as an exporter of terrorism? The U.S. is part of a five-country uh, intelligence alliance called the Five Eyes. Uh, those are five English-speaking countries, the United States, Canada, United Kingdom, Australia, and New Zealand. Three of those four other countries, that being Australia, Canada, and the U.K., have designated U.S.-based uh, groups as terrorist organizations in the same way that the U.S. has designated uh, foreign terrorist organizations on their own list. Um, that is quite a stunning development, uh, I think. So clearly other countries now feel that organizations based in the United States pose a national security threat to them. That's complicated further by the fact that the United States does not have a any kind of domestic uh, terrorist list, nor should it because of the First Amendment. But that means that other countries are basically determining that listen, we have to take this issue into our own hands because we don't think the Americans are going to do it for us. And that is quite quite alarming. Uh, we're seeing tactical and ideological links too. Um, so I think one of the areas where you saw that very strongly was in Brazil on January 8th, 2023, where we saw an election riot that happened in that city, uh, country's capital city, Brasilia, perpetrated by a very similar mob driven by very similar grievances um, tactically and ideologically supported by individuals on the American far right, and all while the leader of that movement was in self-proclaimed exile in in Florida. Um, we've also seen terrorist attacks that occur with manifestos in Slovakia, for example, in New Zealand, where individuals mention political developments in the United States as being important in their radicalization and mm -hmm. mobilization. So yes, the United States has emerged as an exporter of far-right terrorism, as Bruce and I wrote in Foreign Affairs magazine last September, and that is a very serious development. Can I add one thing, Ken? I mean, this, especially as a veteran, you will know this, that uh, basically two decades ago, we called out other countries for exporting what we saw was a poisonous ideology that was uh, being adopted elsewhere, that was fomenting violence, um, terrorism, uh, insurrection even. And it's, it's, 
it, it, it's astonishing to me, having studied terrorism now for nearly 50 years, that the United States is thought of by some of our closest allies in the same way that we're responsible for exporting this poisonous ideology that we chart in the, in the, in the book, for instance, has inspired and motivated terrorist attacks, you know, whether it's New Zealand, Germany, um, Slovakia, other countries. So this is, this is very alarming that the United States finds itself in a position where U.S. groups are designated and the U.S. is called out by its closest allies for exporting this insidious ide ideology. Can you talk about the Christchurch attack and how inspired by the American far right the perpetrator was? I mean, he even chose to use firearms instead of explosives because of the impact it would have on a Second Amendment debate in this country. What we do here reverberates around the world and 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 affects every far right extremist movement there is. Uh, on March 15th, 2019, so it's actually, um, we're just around the fifth anniversary of that attack now, um, a lone gunman called Brenton Tarrant entered two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand, and murdered 51 worshippers in those uh, in those two mosques. Now, he had a lot of inspirations, partly inspired by a terrorist attack that happened eight years earlier in Oslo. Uh, again, an individual driven by this great replacement theory. But Brenton Tarrant advocated for something called accelerationism, which is a strategy of revolution calling for acts of violence that are going to accelerate some kind of catastrophic cataclysmic collapse or apocalypse so that um, the desired world, right, the desired new order can be rebuilt in the aftermath, whatever that means. He felt that one of the best ways to advance that, that race war, that, that chaotic collapse, was a civil war in the United States. And that is why he conducted an attack using... Uh, firearms rather than explosives, as he said, or a flamethrower. Um, he felt that his attack would split the United States into two sides on the gun issue, on the Second Amendment issue. Uh, the left would overreach, the right would react, and you would have a civil war situation. Funnily enough, I mean, not, not funnily enough, but ironically enough, um, his attack would lead to a serious crackdown on firearms in New Zealand. He actually... Um, they had a buyback uh, and banned certain types of, of firearms. Um, and so he did not succeed, of course, in, in accelerating a civil war in the United States, but he did succeed in cracking down on, on guns in his own country. Well, that is such an instructive postscript because in New Zealand, the whole of society response was to address the, the issue and to make it harder for people like that perpetrator to get firearms in the future. The postscript for the anti-government riot insurrection in Brazil that you left out was that society rallied around the legitimate government and held the perpetrators accountable. If you compare those reactions to how the U.S., um, especially one political party in particular reacted to an attack on the government and has reacted to every mass shooting, uh, that, that we now experience on a seemingly weekly basis. It is a damning indictment of our society's ability to adapt to threats. I would actually, so the gun issue does is instructive there, but I would actually point to another thing that happened in New Zealand. So, couple of years, I think, after the attack, the government, actually the Supreme Court released a report um, that was, you know, summarizing their findings into his life and into the response, uh, into preparedness for the next attack. That report was titled in the Maori language, the indigenous language there in New Zealand. This is our home. That was the name of that report. I always felt that was so powerful. The concept of a minority community, a minority religious and racial really community in our country is targeted by a white supremacist claiming to act on behalf of the true New Zealanders, even though he was Australian. And the government responds, the pre predominantly white, at least leadership, Labour government responds by saying, this is 
our home. That was such a strong message of unity across race, religion, party, uh, language. We have lacked that kind of response in the United States, that kind of united, aggressive response against political violence uh, and in defense of people who come here and are minoritized. And I think that does advance, um, advance, open the door to further violence. It's the fact that we don't have that ironclad, united response across party even. That makes counterterrorism very difficult. It's not just that we lack that response. We have influential leaders emboldening the insurrectionists, emboldening people who would undermine our democracy. You referenced, of course, the former president telling the Proud Boys to to stand back and stand by. We have a chorus of people in the Republican Party calling the the January 6th insurrectionists hostages and and martyrs. You had Tommy Tuberville saying that he doesn't see uh, white supremacists in the U.S. military. He sees American patriots. Uh, I, I think it's probably it's going too easy on the Republican influencers in, in this country to say that they're not unifying in response to these threats. They're actually provoking and emboldening them. Well, and also think of it this way. It's terrorism is always a strategy of provocation in any event, and it's eliciting a response on the other side for the past three years, at least polls annually conducted by the Washington Post and the University of Maryland. Roughly, the, the percent stays roughly the same. About a third of Americans uh, believe that in certain circumstances, it is justified to use violence against the federal government. Now, you're right, it's, it's a higher percentage of Republicans, but it's not 0% of people who identify themselves as Democrats. You can see that what as Jacob described, what is going on here in this strategy or ideology of accelerationism is the hope to lock the United States in this upward spiral of violence from both sides, where both sides lose faith in governance, hopefully encourage this violence and disorder to break out that leads to the solution of an authoritarian regime. And that's what I think makes this moment in time so dangerous is this this idea of provocation that could lock us into a, into a spiral of violence that um, really is you know is without precedent. I mean, it, it, it's it's something that uh, that we really haven't had to grapple with except in the twenty years that led up to the Civil War. It's Ken Harbaugh on the Midas Touch Network. The film Against All Enemies, which I co-produced with Ben Micellis and this network, is the number one documentary on Apple TV, and it's now available on Amazon. If you haven't seen it yet, check it out, and please leave a review. It really does make a huge difference in helping spread the word. Thanks, Midas Mighty. Let's use our power well. Lumen is the world's first handheld metabolic coach. It's a device that measures your metabolism through your breath. And on the app, it lets you know if you're burning fat or carbs and gives you tailored guidance to improve your nutrition, workout, sleep, and even stress management. All you have to do is breathe into your Lumen first thing in the morning and you'll know what's going on with your metabolism whether you're burning mostly fats or carbs. Then Lumen gives you a personalized nutrition plan for that day based on your measurements. You can also breathe into it before and after workouts and meals so you know exactly what's going on in your body in real time. And Lumen will give you tips to keep you on top of your health game. The key to metabolic health is something called metabolic flexibility. And that's where Lumen really shines. It refers to your body's ability to efficiently switch between using different fuel sources like carbs and fats. There are preferred times to use each and how well you can switch places you on the metabolic flexibility spectrum. Because your metabolism is at the center of everything your body does, Optimal metabolic health translates to a bunch of benefits, including easier weight management, improved energy levels, better fitness results, better sleep, etc. After getting to know you through your breath, Lumen gives you a metabolic flex score that you can track and improve upon. 
So, if you want to take the next step in improving your health, go to Lumen.me and use Boats to get $100 off your Lumen. That's L-U-M-E-N dot M-E and use Boats at checkout for $100 off. Thanks, Lumen, for sponsoring this episode. We've referenced accelerationism a few times. Jacob, can you explain what that is, the, the connection to the Turner Diaries, this idea that you don't need a massive army to take down the U.S. government. You can provoke in certain ways and accelerate the, uh, the, the apocalyptic end of the status quo. I will let Bruce really weigh in on the Turner Diaries um, because I think he can be more eloquent than I can on, on the origins of that book and, and what they meant. But the Turner Diaries, in, uh, the accelerationism, sorry, in concert with, a, with a, a range of other very clever strategies and operational models has led to a place where terrorism is quite straightforward and counterterrorism is very difficult. One of those uh, strategies is something called leaderless resistance, which was designed by the violent far right in the 1980s and 1990s. Basically, the concept is rather than operate in groups where you leave yourself vulnerable to infiltration and decapitation of the group, uh, it's smarter to operate in decentralized networks as cells or individuals uh, where one arrest, for example, might not lead to the takedown of an entire network. This leads to what you might call lone actor or lone wolf violence. And most of the far-right terrorism we've seen over the past 15 years, let's say, whether it's Oslo or Charleston, South Carolina, or Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Christchurch, New Zealand, Poway, California, El Paso, Texas, Buffalo, New York, Jacksonville, Florida, has operated under these leaderless resistance guidelines often then incorporating that accelerationist bent, which basically says that these acts of violence are not just um, isolated, right? They're not meaningless. They're not just intended to cause ripple effects within a community. They're not just intended to send a message to a, to a community of, uh, to an outgroup that they are not welcome, right? There's also some kind of end goal. There's also an, an intent to, to spark something further. Dylan Roof, the Charleston shooter, for example, his goal was to start a race war. He felt that with a smartly or cleverly targeted act of violence at a historically black church, killing black people in a very public way, that he could inspire some kind of uh, counter strike that would accelerate that that race war, that civil war, uh, that his uh, his brethren would would emerge victorious from. And be able to to reassert their worldview in the aftermath. Uh, it's a very uh, effective strategy when it comes to radicalizing new people towards violence, because you can almost trace out in their minds how how it would be successful. Bruce, do you want to weigh in on the Turner sure. Diaries? You know, the Turner Diaries is is without any doubt the the preeminent pre social media exemplar of violent far right propaganda. It was written or first published, I should say, in 1978 by someone named William Luther Pierce using the pseudonym Andrew MacDonald. Pierce was an um, ex- extremely intelligent individual. Uh, he had a PhD in physics, for example. Um, he had attended uh, Rice University and Caltech, two of the finest universities in the United States. Um, but interestingly, he was also an avowed Nazi. And he led something called the National Alliance, which was a manifestation of the American Nazi Party. Pierce was smart enough to understand uh, back in the 1970s that there was almost that there was only a limited audience for his like endless regurgitations of Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf. And he said, I've got to reach people in a different way. And he hit upon the idea of writing this dystopian novel that would lay down a scenario where a group of quote unquote patriots or the only true patriots. And of course, this is a movement, as you well know, Ken, that, that cloaks itself in the mantle of patriotism as also as top cover that basically stage uh, a revolution in the United States and launch a race war. And as life imitates art, often there was a real life terrorist group 
in the 1980s, calling itself The Order, and The Order is the main terrorist group in this novel. Uh, there was a successor group, uh, The Order Two, or The Silent Brotherhood Two. And then, of course, this novel inspired Timothy McVeigh to carry out the most consequential terrorist attack, or certainly the most lethal terrorist attack in the history of the United States until September 11th, 2001. And that was the 1995 bombing of the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Office Building in Oklahoma City that killed 168 persons. And just like Jacob described, the message of the Turner Diaries is accelerationism. And it's this idea of leaderless resistance of quote unquote true patriots like Timothy McVeigh setting brush fires throughout the U.S. that eventually comes together as the Turner Diary depicts into this gigantic conflagration. Now, many other scholars and many journalists have wrongly said that the FBI terms the Turner Diaries the Bible of the far right. That's not true. At least we found in our research, there's no evidence for that. Rather, what we strongly suspect is that Pierce himself gave the Turner Diaries that moniker in order to sell more copies of it. And he wasn't too far wrong because the Turner Diaries is sold an estimated 250,000 to half a million copies. And to your point of emphasizing January 6, 2021 is such a watershed in the United States. Up until about a week after January 6, 2021, you could buy the Turner Diaries on Amazon.com. It was readily available. Now, the FBI has said that it was an enormously important foundational document. And I think that's exactly right. But we see how it was a blueprint for Timothy McVeigh, because one of the climactic scenes in the Turner Diaries is when the order um, penetrates the FBI headquarters in downtown Washington, D.C., uh, with a truck bomb in the basement that blows it up. Well, the Murrah building did not have a basement, but McVeigh basically used that as his blueprint. And in fact, when Ma Timothy McVeigh was arrested about an hour after the bombing by a very alert Oklahoma state trooper, in a folder on the passenger seat next to him were a bunch of clippings, but also pages excised from the Turner Diaries that McVeigh had highlighted and annotated. And of course, when McVeigh was a soldier stationed at Fort Riley, Kansas, he earned beer money by selling the Turner Diaries at gun shows across the state and surrounding areas. So this may have been McVeigh's Bible, but the FBI actually never used that phrase. How worried should we be about the infiltration of the military and law enforcement by extremist groups. You mentioned McVeigh was an army vet. Stuart Rhodes, uh, army paratrooper. Lewis Beam, who pioneered leaderless resistance, uh, army vet from, from Vietnam. How worried should we be? This has been a controversial conversation when Bruce and I have been out on our book tours. People don't particularly like having this this conversation. We try to have it in quite a nuanced way. Um, I think the first thing to remember is the numbers of extremists in the military are quite small. Um, the number of veterans who are extremists is also quite small. But as we quote an army investigator in the in the book, uh, extremists in the military is like uh, cyanide. Right, The numbers are small, but they can do a lot of damage. Um, and that's the challenge. We find that primarily there are issues with uh, white supremacists and neo-Nazis who seek to enter the military for training, recruitment, radicalization, expertise in communications, and expertise in insurgency and counterinsurgency. And then we see high levels of veterans as well who radicalize, sometimes decades after their service and then conduct attacks or engage in extremist paramilitary activity. Less so, we don't see as much of individuals inside active duty who are radicalizing, you know, as part of military culture, let's say. Uh, veterans, I think, are, are not necessarily more likely than any other extremist, um, or I should say the veterans within extremism are not more likely than any other one, any of the others to conduct attacks. But as we saw um, at Oklahoma City, as we saw at, Oak Creek, Wisconsin, as we saw with that tactical column entering January, entering the U.S. capital on January 6th. Extremists in these, uh, veterans in these extremist groups do have capability to, to conduct um, quite damaging attacks, and that is a concern. What makes veterans susceptible to that kind of radicalization? We know they are targeted specifically 
by these groups. They act as force multipliers when they join these groups. What's the appeal? Well, listen, the military is very concerned right now for good reason about, about suicides in the veteran community. Um, obviously, those numbers are too high. I would hypothesize that the reasons why individuals uh, who are veterans are turning to extremism is probably the same, uh, are, are probably the same reasons why they uh, are turning to suicide in, in unfortunate cases. Those things being uh, mental health issues, including post-traumatic st stress disorder, especially in combat veterans, um, inability to integrate back into civilian life, a feeling that your uh, your service is undervalued or underappreciated or wasted. Each of those things, I think, increase an individual's vulnerability to being pulled into a, an extremist group. And as you said, extremist groups are looking specifically for veterans for the credibility that they have, um, but also uh, also the training, of course, the expertise in, in weapons, the expertise in insurgency and counterinsurgency. So... I would I would frame this as like we need to be protecting veterans who are coming out, individuals who have served the country heroically. We need to be finding ways to protect them from these ideologies and from the extremist groups that are doing a particularly effective job at, at recruiting them uh, because of the skills that they have. Right? We need to be making sure that these veterans, especially those coming back from combat tours, are being really well taken care of by the government, by the, the VA, to ensure that they can live productive healthy, happy lives on the outside and not turn towards these extremist groups that do not wish them well. Bruce, I am fascinated by the, the appearance guns make in, in the book and how the appeal to gun culture was an explicit strategy to expand the movement. I mean, there's a, there's a reason I think you order the title the way you do, Gods, God, Guns, and Sedition. Talk about the, the historical appeal to the gun rights movement as a, a membership play. Sure. Well, I mean, interestingly, the reason we chose that order is that it, it, it sort of maps with the trajectory of the book. Uh, the God part is really describes a movement in the 1980s that did have a much more prominent religious dimension to it in that many of the leaders of the groups that were active at that time, um, intent on violence, prefaced their names with titles like reverend and pastor, preached in the Christian identity church. I mean, look, in an era before social media, the church was one of the best ways to gather large numbers of people in one place. But a seminal event that occurred in 1988 set, set the movement off in a different direction. And this was the trial of 14 white supremacists in Fort Smith, Arkansas, on charges of seditious conspiracy, uh, the same charges that 22 members of the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers were convicted of uh, rising from January 6, 2021. However, in 1988, they all were acquitted. And when they were acquitted, this prompted uh, two changes in the movement. Firstly, they recoiled at the fact that had there been convictions, the movement could have been decapitated. And we've already discussed the advent of leaderless resistance. Lewis Beam had articulated that already in 1983 and 1984, but by 1992 was doubling down on it. But the other big development was that like any terrorist movement, there's this perennial search for new constituencies or a new demographic to appeal to. And this was right around the time that the militia movement was coalescing and emerging. And and therefore, violent far-right extremists seized upon the Second Amendment issue as, as, as a fulminate, as a way to draw people into the movement. And of course, we have to think back to the early 1990s when President Bill Clinton had just been elected president, actually did embark on a very ambitious effort to institute gun control in the United States. And for a decade, in fact, uh, was successful in implementing a ban on assault weapons that expired in the mid 2000s. And we can see some of the results of that in the litany of mass shootings we've, we've experienced. But this whole um, notion that the federal government was coming to take your guns really gained traction. In fact, once again, that great huckster and impresario, William Luther Pierce, 
change the back cover of the Turner Diaries with big, bold letters. It said in the 1990s, what will you do when they come to take your guns? In other words, to draw people into this movement. And in fact, that was one of McVeigh's motivations amongst many. Uh, but one of them was uh, certainly avenging uh, Ruby Ridge and Waco, but also it was this fear that the United States government was going to seize weapons. So that became really a launching pad that sustained this movement and actually enabled it to grow and laid the foundation of it to be this big tent that we see today. You've referred to the fact that 30 percent of Americans now feel, at least according to some polls, that violence may be necessary, violence against the government may be necessary under some circumstances. When people talk about civil war, what goes through your head? Surely it's not massed armies, but what could it look like if we have a, a dramatic rendering of our social fabric in a nation, a wash in guns and, um, you know, riven by divisions and, and polarization. Well, this is the opening framing of our, of our book, right? Is this notion that a lot of scholars actually have written about what civil war in the United States would look like, uh, basically from the foundational premise that civil war in the United States is now inevitable. Uh, we don't see that uh, largely for geographic reasons, as you've pointed out. You don't really have the land divisions that you had during the US, during the first American Civil War, if you want to put it that way. So you don't have this division that runs north-south or east-west that would facilitate massed armies. Uh, what you have is urban-rural divides um, and, uh, you know, divisions within cities that, that might spark violence we see a more likely scenario as actually what happened in Northern Ireland uh, during the troubles, right, of sustained, widespread violence from multiple factions targeting both government and the public uh, in ways that are very corrosive to, to democracy, uh, to the social fabric, to unity as a country. I find it kind of discouraging that there is so much discussion of civil war because it almost it almost leads you to think well okay so if we avoid civil war that's that's a victory uh when in reality there is a whole range of catastrophic violence that we could see in this country well short of civil war that would very effectively cripple um our country at a time when we're embarking on this new gen new era in national security and foreign policy and that is very, very dangerous, I think. Um, so our analysis is that civil war is unlikely and not inevitable. Um, but that does not mean that everything is okay and that um, we should not be playing a very active role in trying to stop, stop violence that's coming down the road. Bruce, any final thoughts? I would agree with Jacob. I, and I think the scariest um, aspect is that the means and methods of implementing violence in the United States are, you know, readily accessible. And we've seen how, at least in terms of terrorist threats in this country, unlike in the 20th century where big bombings, much like Oklahoma City, or even smaller bombings. There were 3,600 bombings, for instance, in the United States between 1970 and 1971. The reason we don't remember them is the vast majority were non-lethal. What we see now is terrorism is undeniably becoming more lethal everywhere. Uh, but also in the United States, at least, I think um, the means and methods of engaging in violence are just, you know, are, are, are just so readily obtainable that um, anyone who does want to embark hubristically or as unrealistically as one could think on at least trying to implement a civil war um, can at least believe and have the um, the conceit that their act of violence could trigger this wider conflagration, which of course is exactly at the heart of the message of the Turner Diaries. Do you perceive a weird fetishization around this idea of civil war within some quarters of 
of the right. When I look at the the military cosplay culture, uh, when I read some of the the traffic that gets forwarded to me about preparations for civil war, uh, it, well, I guess this is part of the accelerationist mindset. They want it to happen. Well, on January 6, 2021, there were stockpiles of weapons in motels in Roslyn and in Northern Virginia communities that were waiting to be tapped into and for a rapid response. And that gives, I think that's, that's the, about as good as illustration you're going to find of, of how readily accessible or how appealing this type of violence can be for certain people and why the threat is taken so seriously. I'll, I'll give another illustration, Bruce, uh, that I think of, Ken, when you use the word feti fetishization, uh, and that's the Boogaloo movement, right? This is a movement. So the Boogaloo, for those who, who aren't aware, um, is an anti-government, kind of pro-gun anti-government movement um, that takes its name from a movie that's kind of a cult classic, I think, from the 80s, uh, Break Into Electric Boogaloo, I think, um, and Boogaloo, because that movie was a sequel, they took that name uh, to indicate that the Boogaloo is the sequel to the first American Civil War. Uh, now, this group is very uh, incorporates humor and irony heavily into its messaging and symbology. One thing they do, for example, is they they frequently wear Hawaiian aloha shirts with igloos on them because big igloo and big luau were some of the terms they would use to try to evade social media uh, content moderation algorithms. So this is a group that very seriously in some of its rhetoric talks about like legitimate civil war against the government, um, but at the same time is doing so in a very kind of crass, humorous, unserious way. Uh, and I think that is that fetishizing of widespread violence without any real uh, understanding, A, of the capability that would be required for that to happen, and B, just how profoundly horrendous uh, and bloody such a scenario would be and how, frankly, nobody at all, of course, would, would benefit from, from that situation. Well, well, that's just it. The fetishization is in complete ignorance of what the actual outcomes would be. I was in Afghanistan in 2006. I've had military vets on this show who have been in the middle of civil wars and, uh, and the military people who are involved in these, these movements in the U S many of them are, are playing out fantasies that, that they didn't actually get to participate in overseas. Uh, I think very few people who've actually seen combat, close up, much less a civil war, think there's anything romantic or glamorous about it at all. The United States is, is really in a, a remarkable situation now that one can say that no matter what the outcome of November's presidential election is, we could be faced with equally compelling and worrisome scenarios of violence. And it really speaks to, I think, the erosion of what America is. I mean, I, I, you know, constantly think back to um, the evening of September 11th, 2001, when Republican and Democratic congressmen locked arms on the steps of the U.S. Capitol and sang God Bless America, and how enormously reassuring that was, at, you know, on a day that we've suffered one of our greatest traumas in our nation's history. To see that kind of spirit, I found uh, enormously, uh, as I said, reassuring, but also uh, inspiring. And we need to somehow return to that moment where we're not at each other's throats. And I don't know how we get there, but it doesn't seem that it's something that will necessarily happen anytime soon. Well, I'm with you. I, I long for that sense of, of unity and shared uh, purpose again. But uh, I think ultimately it's going to come down to, to voters holding the bad actors accountable. Jacob, Bruce, thank you so much for joining us. You're, you're very welcome. Thanks for having us. Love this video? Make sure you stay up to date on the latest breaking news and all things Midas by signing up to the Midas Touch newsletter at MidasTouch.com newsletter.